Today, I'm talking to Jeff Wilson, not just a top real estate agent in Washington, D.C., not just a top real estate agent in Sotheby's International Realty, but consistently recognized by the Wall Street Journal as a top real estate agent in America. He's so much fun to talk to. He's transparent. He really talks about the emotions and the things that we go through as agents and how responding to them in the right way and really sticking to the basics has contributed to huge wild success in his career. Thanks for listening to the Jerry Metcalf podcast, where top real estate agents tell how they do it. This podcast is to share knowledge for realtors and raise awareness for Give Back Homes, where real estate professionals work together for social good. Jet Centers Aviation, Bentley Atlanta, Legends Global, thank you for your sponsorship. All right, everybody, welcome to the Jerry Metcalf podcast. We are so excited to have Jeff Wilson with us today. He is in Washington, D.C. Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the real estate business. Hi, Jerry. It's an honor to be here today. Um, well, I'm a native Washingtonian. I was born and raised here, which I feel lucky to be because it's such a great city. And I, I'm a huge fan of our city, The not just the real estate, but the culture, the restaurants, the Smithsonian's, the... Um, the Kennedy Center, the theaters, our proximity to things, the monuments. I mean, I could go on and on. It's just a great place to be. I feel very fortunate to be here. Um, I got into real estate almost by accident, to be honest with you. And uh, I've been doing it long enough now that I really groomed my business to fit very much who I am as a person. And I feel fortunate that I stuck it out as long as I did. Yeah. Uh, I graduated from college in 1987 and frankly went right into real estate sales without much real forethought, without much, uh, frankly, training or sales training or knowledge of the process or people. And uh, yeah. I'd like to consider myself more the, the tortoise than the hare. Uh, I never give up and I keep going, albeit slowly. And it took me only three decades to really get to where I am now. And uh, it's a great place to be. Well, you've got a strong foundation and you do really well now. Um, and I think that says a lot because you've got a lot to teach us about. And also how you've seen the business change over the years. When you got into real estate, I think there was probably, you know, you and I talked about it was kind of the business that it was a second job or it wasn't really the well-respected business that we, and with such there's really some successful people that could be CEOs and they choose to do real estate in this business and, and run it like, a, and they run their business like a company. But give us a little feel of what you got in the business, what it was like then, how it's changed and what it's like now. Wow. Uh, well, it was literally completely different. Um, and I bet a lot of agents out there don't really understand what it used to be and what it is now. And what I mean by that is when I started, there were, uh, a few people that would, quote unquote, make their living doing real estate. But I think it was more uh, like second incomes for families. You know, it wasn't the, the number one position in, in most households anyway. Mm -hmm. There were no such thing as teams. Uh, there were not even assistants. Literally, nobody had an assistant. That's and uh, this is yeah. uh, really, I mean, so this is back in the day before uh, cell phones. Uh, before even fax machines, before the internet. Um, and real estate agents, we were positioned in a way of being kind of the gatekeepers of the information, mm -hmm. meaning that we had, we had MLS. And believe it or not, I mean, true story, buyers used to have to drive through neighborhoods to look for signs. I mean, that was <laughs> their, their right. version of the internet, really. They were on yeah. an intercoastal highway. You know, they were not on the internet. It didn't exist. And uh, if they wanted to really know what was going on in a neighborhood or when something came up without just having the luck of driving by a house and seeing a sign, they needed a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were the gatekeepers. There was no public uh, way to find information reliably other than us. Um, and arguably, fast forward, my first cell phone was the size of a shoebox, uh, and it was $50 a minute to even talk on it. So you'd get a phone call and you'd say, I'll call you right back. 
and you'd I'll run, call, run to a, a payphone. Pay yeah. Right, payphone. So you'd be sitting there shoving the quarters in, you know, making your phone calls. Um, and, uh, you know, the, our contracts were one page, one legal size piece of paper. It had all the contingencies and everything, not even front and back. Uh, our computer printouts, if you even call it that, were on thermal paper. Uh, and all of the information was contained in about three or four inches of paper, period. Wow. Um, and there were no photos. You couldn't see houses. You had to literally go to them to see them both inside and out. So brokers opens were very popular back then. Uh, open houses were a major way of, you know, letting people see a house for the very first time. And I also think that it was, frankly, easier to sell houses that weren't so perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, because you couldn't necessarily scan and see, you know, 15, 20, 30, or five, depending on your market properties to see what they look like to say, oh, I want to see that one. You, you kind of had to go by the comments, you know, what does, right. What does updated really mean? You know, is that a marketing term? Or you had to go see all of them. Right. So So. the, the business is quite different. And then fast forward to today, obviously we have the internet, you know, people can surf for properties at 11 o'clock while sitting in bed in their underwear. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of data out there for buyers and sellers alike. We have the Redfins, the Trulias, the Zillows. Um, you know, so there's the, this explosion of data, and we are no well, longer the geek. Yeah, well, and then there's Matterport where you get the 3D Correct. tour and now we're going to have the virtual glasses goggles, and you goggles right. and you get on the internet right. and you walk through a house. Right. So seeing houses is very easy. And frankly, for the most part, other than private listings or things that are coming on the market that are not yet in MLS, finding data is not that hard. Right. So I, I think where our industry has evolved necessarily to survive is that we are, as real estate professionals, in the position now of providing context to that data. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? How does that house fit into the scheme of the other ones that, that have sold? You know, even in condo sales, I had a client call me crying right? one day, and, and she said, oh, my gosh, you know, here's our price. We're at a million three, and Zillow says that this other unit's the one to buy. No, you know, because it yeah. was a, a lower price per square foot. And I'm like, calm down, calm down, please. You know, we have this <laughs> stunning unit. Like, everything was renovated. Right. It was unbelievable. Right. Yeah. And, and the unit that they were comparing it to was one in the lower level of the building with bars on the windows, and it overlooked the dumpster. You know, and sure enough, we sold for within a couple thousand dollars of our list price, and the, the Zillow Best Buy came off the market. It never sold. So... Uh, I think that our role now is actually more complex than it was before. We're, we're not only required to find things, which is arguably not as hard, mm-hmm. uh, but then to provide true analysis and context and guidance and advice that uh, really it's hard yeah. if you're not experienced. And uh, I think it's hard to get well, that experience in this kind of market. And the teams didn't exist before, and now one of my biggest regrets is not starting on a team um, because mm-hmm. when you're on a team, you get that context. You understand so much of our business is the complexity of the emotions of the seller or the buyer and helping them understand the market. And there, there's almost an overload of data going into them that now we need to help them, like you said, understand what it is and what it really means. And what is this estimate? Does estimate does not mean that's what a house is worth. It means that the logarithm or algorithm or whatever it is that Zillow has is a number they pulled and came up with and it's out there. And my favorite story is a listing that I had that had two addresses. One was the mailing address and Mm. one was the tax record address. And on Zillow, the difference in value, and this was a house that was worth about $750,000. This was under half a million, I mean, under a million dollar listing. And the difference in Zillow was over 200,000 between Mm -hmm. the tax record address and because of the because of the street, because of whatever their formula mm-hmm. was, one street made it worth less than the other. I mean, I don't know, or I don't know what it was, but it's that was just. It, I love when that happened. I was like, what a blessing, because now it's just a story I can tell people to understand. Zillow's great; it's got its benefits. It's got its, its a lot of the great things about it, but it doesn't know how much a house is worth. 
the buyer decides what that one's worth. So, and so our, our goal now, yeah. I think, is really helping clarify what people hear and what they think they know. And not that, you know, right, I exactly. care to be right all the time. I don't really care to be right. But buying and selling real estate, especially expensive real estate, is a significant undertaking for most people. And and being led down a path that's not productive is not only just not going to succeed, but it's actually harmful to that client. Yeah. We all know that days on market becomes the anvil, you know, against which a buyer will slam a seller. And anvil we have to be that. very exactly. mindful. Yeah. So we have to be very careful as we're, as we're advising our clients. And, you know, again, with all the information out there, it's very easy for people to think they understand things and, and maybe to be a bit misinformed. And to help them. Yeah, it's Correct. huge. And I think people know that. I think it's interesting. Everybody thought that, I want to get back on to you, but it, everybody thought Zillow was going to replace the real estate agent. And it's just made us more valuable, which is really I cool. agree with you. So I want to know, in an industry that's so competitive, there are so many people You've been in this business, what did you, What was it, 30 years or how many Almost years? 30 years, yeah. So, so 30 years you have been a successful real estate agent and you've become incredibly successful. Um, that is important to say because so many people come in this business, they're successful for a year, they get in, they rock it, they get out, or they get in, they realize how hard it is and they get out, but they get in and they get out. You've maintained a consistent level of success for three decades. What is it about you that, that makes you able to do that and makes you literally not just the top five, but the top 1%? Because it's such an uncommon, um, it's, so, it's so hard to find a good, consistent real estate for three decades. What do you think is about you that, that you're that 1%, that the 99% of us aren't? Hmm. And you can go ahead and brag. I'll I, give you permission yeah. now. I want no, to know the I'm truth. I just, I just don't give up. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a fierce competitor. Um, one of the things that I've really appreciated about my real estate journey is the ability to have certain personality assessments done, and and under one particular assessment, one of my attributes is called a conqueror, and it's a very intensely competitive attribute, and, and so conquerors will win at all costs. Um, typically, we won't play a game we can't win. So we're, we're very we we we, <laughs> right. we assess the landscape and say, can I can I succeed there or not? And um, so I'm very tenacious. I will not give up. I will just keep going. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there was an analogy or a story many years ago, and I wish I were more historically um, able to nail the person who said it. But you know, there was this theory that when uh, certain conquerors came to foreign lands, you know, to really conquer those lands, they would burn the boats. They didn't give the men a way to get back home to safety. Mm -hmm. So once they got to shore, they burned the boats and the men had to wow. win. If they didn't win, they would perish. And uh, yeah. I don't really feel like I'm in that position right now. But when I started, I was. I had no yeah. other choice. I was going to make it or I was going to sink. And I was not going to sink. And exactly. so I just kept going and I kept working and I kept gathering information and I kept getting training and I kept trying and I kept failing and I kept trying and then I gained some modicum of success and then I used that to get more business and garner more clients and, you know, my business model has changed many, many times over the years and, mm -hmm. and I will say that uh, nowadays I just feel blessed to be in this industry because I understand how important my advice is to somebody as they're making a transition, mm -hmm. you know, and, and moving is a transition, whether it's their first home or their last home or something in between or, you know, taking on a property for a family member. Uh, I view our role as incredibly important in people's lives. And so I take that role very seriously. And I feel fortunate that I, I feel competent and confident enough to, to truly advise people as they need me to. And it's taken a while to get there. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> Most people figure this out in a few years. Well, it took me maybe not quite 30, but the better part of 30 years to that. figure it out. You're just consistent, which is good. Um, so I think what you, so, but get, what is it that gives you your, you definitely have an edge about you. You have just a very, 
comforting way of working with clients, you're consistent, and maybe that is, I'm answering the question, but I like to know what it is about, everybody's got, everybody's kind of got their thing that attracts their right. clients and makes them successful. If you could put that right. into a couple of words, what, what would it be? Right. I think that's a great question. Um, again, going back to my, my heritage profile, which came out of Buffini coaching, Yeah. you know, they gave me a, a beautiful profile and who I really am. And the thing that I most appreciated about Buffini coaching at the beginning was truly this roadmap into me yeah. and, and over a 17 year study of my report about me, yeah. the more I look back over the things where I was most engaged and the times where I was most successful and the, the moments I was most happy, I can see my various attributes um, coming to life through me. And the, one of the other ones is actually trusted advisor. That's one of the, the little titles on, on my report. So I'm naturally wired to be that way. I don't have to mm -hmm. fake it. So as I've learned to lean into my abilities, I've just become more authentic in who I am as a person and what skills I bring to the table for my clients. Mm -hmm. And that just allows more connectivity on the human level. And it's just helped me grow my business year after year. And now I get to play and have fun with it, which is really the great news at the end. Yeah, so the to fun speak. thing about this whole business is we always get, it's a, it's a, you can, you can figure out what you're the best at and play with it and have fun and leverage And I just looked else. back the other day because yeah. my assistant was out for a couple of days and there were so many things that I could do, but I don't care to do. And frankly, I haven't done in a long time. Exactly. And it, it was just one of those moments where I had a little bit of clarity and I thought, wow, I guess I planned this because I hired her and I trained her and I've asked her to do these things for me. Yeah. But so much of, of, of this business, I don't end up doing anymore because I've hired somebody who's equally capable as I am. And exactly. it allows me to spend my time doing the things that are most the best at. Yeah. valuable. Exactly. Yeah. And I, it just, it fits her better. It fits me better. It fits my clients better. They truly get the best of me and that's what they want and deserve. So in this business, I bet you have had a lot of ahas, whether it's, it's not just putting a sign in the yard or it's actually a lot of work or how much more it's not if you like to look how, at houses, but how your ability to handle people is what makes you successful in this business. Those are just a few examples. But what is your maybe most recent or biggest aha about this business? I would say absolutely it's the people. I mean, I think that we're in the people business mm -hmm. and we're, we're working with people as they're transacting in real estate. I think it has to come there first. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've done really well, frankly, with my intuition, just letting my inner voice speak to me, hopefully not on the path <laughs> to madness, but, <laughs> but, but <laughs> like, Ooh, what's that voice? Um, just yeah. really, I think it just comes through experience and, and having enough life experience at this point to really put myself in my client's shoes and to understand what they're going through and, and to make those very well-placed phone calls kind of at the right moment yeah. and to, to touch people on a deeper level mm -hmm. than, than maybe I would have done even five and ten years ago. I think it really yeah. comes a lot through experience and understanding and, and, and using the nuance of that to assist people better. So true. Well, and, and, you know, I think to speak to what you're saying, understanding that, you know, for a long time, I got in this bit, I was like you, I was going to sink or make it. I had to make money and this was it. And it was, it was kind of transactional when I was younger mm. and luckily I was working with builders. So I was a little more successful that way. But as I got older and I dealt with more families because I had kids, you start realizing like, this isn't just a transaction. This is the yeah. foundation yeah. of someone's well being. It's the foundation right. of their, it's the physical foundation. You've got to be healthy. You've got to do all these things. Right. And you've got to be in the right, if you're, if you're not in the right home or you don't have that right foundation, it can change everything. So you've got to understand your client and be able to help them. And the person, you know, they've got to have the right home and they've got to financially do it the right way. And you've got to, we're a huge part of that. Um, and, you're, and you have to use yeah. all your skills and all of your experience to get them to that point. Not exactly. everybody's that successful. I, I think that I'm able to achieve sales that other people aren't able to achieve just because I'm like, hmm, 
I think I should handle it this way, you know, and not in a manipulative way that I'm trying to do things that people don't want. I mean, that's just as a losing proposition at the beginning, but really helping people sometimes past themselves. Exactly. You know, there's a lot of resistance and a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty and, you know, being there to be supportive and, and, uh, guiding and forward future casting about how things are going to play out. Uh, a brand new agent, hard time to do that unless they're watching somebody do it and they emulate that. So Mm -hmm. back when I started, there were no mentors, there were no teams. Everyone was in a bullpen and you could sort of hear what somebody might say to somebody, but that was so limited. Um, You know, and now it's quite different. I have, you know, three agents that I'm mentoring on my team, really almost four at this point. I'm working closely with somebody in in a close by market of ours. And you know, and I and I try to benefit them with my experience, how I say things, how I explain things. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it's almost the personal energy that you bring to the process that lets people go, this person knows what they're doing. I can trust this person and they're they're recommending I do this and I'm gonna do that. Rather than, you know, any slightly different energy of anxiety or pressure yeah. or I'm not so sure or, you know, I've never done this before and, yeah. and I think think that that exact same client in that same scenario may end up doing nothing. Well, and um, uh, you know, it's to speak, to speak again to what you're talking about, I've, I quote, I've quoted Jack Cotton a lot lately, but it's so mm. relevant. He talks about, I don't always do the best CMA. I don't, I don't have the best stage or he doesn't, he doesn't do staging. He actually has a, right. another angle. Property on staging. preparation. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I've been listening. Yeah. I love been it. Listening. The property pressure preparation list. Yeah. He's all, but, but, He's, but he says, but the one thing I do better than anybody is know and figure out what my client wants and help and or help them figure out what's best for them. But it's right. such a huge part of it. You know, so much of it is it's not about making the most phone calls. It's not about this. It's, it's, it is about working hard and prospecting. But ultimately, in the end, you can prospect all you want if you don't represent your client well and help and know what's best for them and help them know what's best for them. Then you don't get it. You, you, you doesn't get done. Which is part right. of what well, I love about ago, this. I love that about this business. Right. Many years ago, my business model was going after expired, and I would pound the phone <clears> at seven thirty in the morning, and I just got. I don't thick see you doing that. Pe- yeah, yeah. Oh, people would hang up on me, and I'd call right back, and I'd say, "I'm sorry, we must have had a bad connection. It's me again, you know." And and yeah. I got good at it. I was listing maybe ten wow. plus houses a month. Really, but it was so transactional because it was a very. Yeah. It didn't need to be, but it was kind of a combative situation. You know, they yeah. they wanted their pound of flesh for having a bad experience, and now you're telling them to lower their price and raise their commission and do all these things. And you know, and I remember my my first parties that I would throw at my home. I invited all of my colleagues, all of my people from my office, and the thought of a client crossing my threshold would have made my skin crawl because I'm like, you are not coming here because I was so separate from my clients. And fast forward now, not that I, well, let's be real. I don't invite my colleagues anymore. You know, it's all about my clients and the relationships that I've had with them and the three generations of people that I've served in their family. And, you know, we're getting ready to do a big party out at our uh, fall ste- or spring steeplechase race out at oh, our country fun. property. And, yeah. you know, it's it's 40 people. It's a beautiful invite. It's phone calls beforehand. It's, you know, race day tickets and a whole spread at the races. It's come to our house for coffee and dessert after. It's very personal, very connected, very high level of service. And, it, you know, my business is completely morphed from one model into the other. And, and this is where I, I kind of light up. You know, this is how I was designed to be. And the more I lean into this, it just life is more fun. Business is more fun. And I get the opportunity to really serve people at a d- deeper level. That, that's, yeah, that's incredible. And that's what's so great about this business. So I don't know if I told you I was going to ask you this, but it's a fun question. Do you have a story... Mm. I love, I think in our, in, especially in our business, there's so much, there's so much opportunity for success. And there's also, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity for failure. It's, it's a, it's a tough business. That's why, what is it? Is it what is the statistic? I think 80, 80 or not. No, I think it's 95% of people who enter this business don't make it two years. Right. So do you have any stories for us of a big failure that taught you a big lesson or something that looked like it wasn't such a great thing falling through at one time ended up being some huge, great outcome Hmm. in the Hmm. end? Yeah. So 
I have a couple of them, and okay. so I'll tell one, and you tell me if you want to hear another one. So okay. one was my a very good friend from college, and we had lost touch, and she was now married, and uh, she I found out through my buyer's agent at the time that he was showing them houses, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen her in years. So we went out to lunch, and so during this lunch, we reconnected, and then fast forward a couple months later, I get a phone call, and it's like, hi. I just want to let you know that uh, I'm sorry, but we walked into an open house and we just, we couldn't resist and we ended up buying it. And I was like, wow, you know, just like Harry Carey, Wait, you know, did you just not like, know how this works. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, I was not happy and, and mind you, I did the wrong thing and I did the right thing. So uh, the right thing was that I didn't shred them. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, you know, said, oh, congratulations. You know, I'm sure you're very excited. I don't know where that came from because it was not what I was feeling. And I got back to the office and I'm like, delete them. They are gone. They are dirt. They are <laughs> gone uh, out of my life. History finished. I'm done. You know, took them out of my database. They didn't exist to me anymore. And literally like three months later, I get a phone call. Hi, Jeff. It's so-and-so. Um, my really good friend wants to buy a house. Can you help her? I'm like, ah, oh, yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. And mind you, yeah. she left a message for me and I didn't have her number. Like everything was gone. And now it's like fire drill in the office. Like, how do we reconnect with this person? And, yeah. and so long story short, I, you know, because I didn't ruin the relationship, uh, she referred me. And subsequent to that, they, the house they bought, they, they worked on all these plans and plans and plans. And finally, she said, my husband is not willing to spend a million dollars making this house the way we want it. Um, we use sell it for us and I'm like wow. sure there goes another uh, no one problem. so we another deal yeah, yeah so we put that one on the market and then we were trying I lived in a certain neighborhood at that point in Maryland and the house that they had bought was also in that neighborhood and so we sold that one and they're like well we still want to live in the neighborhood and I don't know why we were driving around but we were driving and they pointed at a house they said we want that one and it was the most beautiful house in the whole neighborhood in the back of my mind again, like inside voice, outside voice, like inner voice, outer voice in my yeah. mind. I'm like, <laughs> good luck. Like, what are the odds? You know, like that's it's not for sale, you know, right. whatever. But of course, I said, I'll call them and we'll see what happens. Well, guess what? I called the guy. He's like, yeah, I'm actually planning to move. If your buyer wants the house, like write up an offer. Wow. So I, I sold them that house. And then once they were ready to move in there, you know, they said, well, you know, we're we're, um, we need to sell our current home. Will you sell that one too? And I'm like, absolutely. You know, so and subsequent to that, they've referred me to deal. friends yeah. and family. And, you know, so I guess the, the lesson is that you never, uh, ruin a relationship over business yeah, absolutely. because at the end of the day, we can't probably remember half of the transactions we did even a year ago, but we certainly remember our friends from 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. So like, Business comes second. Friendship comes first. Love that. If you truly yeah. get excited yeah. about people and what they're doing, you'll get plenty. You know, it may not be everyone, but you'll get plenty. And so that was a true. really good lesson to me. And sometimes we all get those phone calls. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Jeff. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> I know right. what's coming, and yeah. I don't want to hear this. You know? Yeah. But Great character building business that we're in, though. Isn't it, it is. It is. That's what, it that is. might be what I love most about it. So it keeps, yes. keeps me a much better person than I might than I might be otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. And we always you have to behave it. ourselves right. Like normally, if we, you know, we might say things we shouldn't say. But I mean, is that terrible to, to say? But I love that because you find yeah, well, that you know, being doing the right thing always, always comes around. It's always the route to go. I love that. Um, I agree. What is one thing? Well, and your the business has changed so much since you've been in it, so there may be a lot. But if there's one thing that you could know now, or maybe three, that you didn't know coming into this business, being a real estate agent, what would it be? Hmm, that's pretty profound. Um, I think that you, as an agent or I as an agent uh, should be very clear about how we want our business to be. Uh, I think a lot of us jump, jump in, you know, feet first, mm -hmm. head first. We're flailing around, you know, like a person who can't swim without, you know, a life vest, you know, a few lifelines come our way. We grab at anything that we can and we start pulling ourselves up and, 
maybe we don't end in a market where we really have any interest or any real passion. Mm -hmm. And and I would like to think if I were to start over that I would be more clear about what I want at the beginning Mm -hmm. and spending my time going after that. I think I would be significantly more successful now than had I yeah. Then how I started, so to speak. Or be sp- um, maybe be specific and be intentional. And it's not that you can't change that, but if correct, you, you, you know, can you, change it any day you want to change it. But you're going to get more day. direct results out of what you're doing right now if you've got a specific goal in mind as to what that Absolutely. is. Absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah. I I I cut my teeth out in kind of the very, very, very far out suburbs of I wouldn't even call it Washington D.C. I mean, yes, they were. D.C. suburbs, but no one would refer to these neighborhoods as D.C. suburbs. You know, mm-hmm. they were like way out in Maryland because I could get business there. Mm-hmm. You know, and I spent a lot of years driving a lot of miles to go to less expensive properties. And not that everybody wants to sell the billion dollar properties or be in a specific market, but mm-hmm. I was not I was not um, aligned with that market. Ultimately, I was mm-hmm. not, you know, and I found that for me, and again, I, I would recommend that people find what resonates with them. But for me, being closer in, as I've always lived myself, mm-hmm. and and being in, in nicer locations, and for me, nicer locations, and nicer neighborhoods, and higher price points, and prettier houses, that just resonates more with me. Mm-hmm. So had I spent more time targeting that at the beginning, you know, and aligning with uh, people and clients in that realm, which I'm mm-hmm. doing handily now, um, maybe I'd be retired by now well, and we wouldn't be doing this podcast. <laughs> I'd put you down and find you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh yeah, and it's also think, remembering the opportunity cost of everything, taking those listings and driving out to the suburbs, what was the time and the car that you could have been winning other business? So it's I mean, unbelievable. Important. A lot yeah. of my my contemporaries, if if that's even a word, you know, people that have been in as long as I've been in, Mm -hmm. you know, I was going out and they were coming in Mm -hmm. and their price points were five and 10 times higher than mine. And their sales were much brisker than mine just because of the market times. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look at their businesses now and they're two and three times more productive than Mm -hmm. I am now. Um, And I also don't think that my years doing that were specifically wasted. I mean, I definitely learned a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned about marketing and remarketing of properties and and how to present things well. And, you know, it was all good training. Mm -hmm. I would have just made more money and probably faster had I gone and for a market more. that You've actually in, appeals to me. Well, yeah. you would have been in your element a lot sooner because high end right. is definitely your element. Um You've got a team. Tell us a little. I love mm-hmm. to learn how everybody structures their team. What's the structure you've got set up? Right now, I have one full-time assistant. I had two until one of mine retired last year, so she was with me for 15 years. Wow. It's shocking to me, not only, A, to have an assistant, but to have someone that long that they retire. I mean, yeah. you, don't, you don't often hear the word retire in the real estate you're, industry. You're but, right about that. You know, So she retired, and now I'm down to one. I need to bump up to another what I call boots-on-the-ground assistant. Mm -hmm. The level of service that we provide our clients, uh, just even attending photo shoots and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, staging meetings, property preparation meetings, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and running keys places. And, and yes, we're sometimes on lockbox, but just the physical hours required to bring our properties on the market and do it the way we do, we need more help. Mm-hmm. So uh, I have one right now. I have almost a full-time virtual assistant who helps get a lot of my marketing ideas onto a platform that they can actually be used. Uh, and then I have uh, three uh, agent specialists on my team. I don't want to call them just buyer's agents because they both do listings and sales. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm mentoring them uh, in growing their business and in performing their business both. Mm-hmm. you know, kind of the mindset and the practice. Oh, that's great. And so does every, do you have, do the agents have roles or there's, they're, they're, I'm assuming they're exclusive to your team and they work for your Correct. team and you Correct. give them business and they give, they, Correct. the team all goes under your name and all Correct. that good stuff. Great. Yeah. And have you learned any lessons? I think a lot, there's a lot of, you know, in our business, Ooh. everybody's trying to build a team and they build it yeah. and it crashes. And I've done that a few times myself, which some of your advice on building a strong, long lasting team. Yes. Um, 
indestructible I think yeah. Oh, good. Good luck <laughs> maybe, with that. Yeah, I was going to say maybe that's maybe I'm asking the impossible. <laughs> the so, advice is no. Don't, right? don't do it. Just don't um, do it. Right. So I think you have to be clear about why you want a team mm -hmm. and what people's functions are to be on the team. And then I think as well, I've experienced that there's kind of two kinds of agents. One are like the young mavericks that, you know, come at you and they want to be on your team and they want to learn from you and they literally soak up everything that you have to offer, which I think is valid and valuable. It has mm -hmm. to be kind of a fair trade one both ways. Right. But those people in general, I've experienced, do not stay with you, mm -hmm. you know, and eventually you become a cost of doing business to them. And when right. they are uh, feeling their oats, you know, they're going to cut ties and move on. Right. So. So as long as you go into it understanding that and you feel that your association with them while they're together with you is, is valuable to both of you, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, I've had a few of those and the, the, the verb is had as in past, past tense, tense, right? They're yeah. gone, right? And I knew better. Um, so now I'm a little more clear about who I want on my team. Uh, I... I don't mind a, a maverick, but I would want somebody in that role to become ultimately a business partner as I transition out. And I'm nowhere near that. So right. maybe that role is not well suited for me right now. But what I have right now, I call my practitioners. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, they want a steady income. They, they're not looking to be the number one agent in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, they they understand that my tenure and my experience and my way of doing things and saying things and 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 writing things, mm -hmm. uh, including contracts, uh, will advantage them and they will lose as much as they would have lost on their own. So they see value in me and I see value in them and I'm happy to give them some of my clients. Mm -hmm. um, I have you know more clients than I can handle thankfully. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm more than happy to, to really look myself in the mirror and say, Jeff, are you enthusiastic about this? Are you, you know, head first? Are you going to give this client your all? And if there's any resistance within me that says, ah, 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 if there's any hesitation, I'm like, they go to my team because my team will you know, be enthusiastic and, and mm -hmm. ready to go and excited about the opportunity and, and they'll run with it. Yeah. And that actually makes me happy. And, and really that is better for the client. Exactly. You know, cause I'm sure that you've had people either referred to you or somebody calls you and in your mind, you're like, eh, maybe not. I yeah. might not be the best agent for you, but hopefully they're close enough to you that you can say, but I've got somebody that I, I completely trust and they're incredible yeah. and I know they would love to take care of you and, and let me make that connection. Right. And that, and then you can make sure they're taken care of because you're still, business is still being done in the way that to the Absolutely. level of expectation that it'll be fulfilled and at the level of service that they need Absolutely. and we get to you. Absolutely. They're still within our realm, right? They're still within our realm. They're still being handled by our processes and our systems and our mindset and, and just the way we do things. Um, you know, I've, I've cut back some of my work hours lately. I, you know, we have three little girls and we now have a house an hour outside of DC in the countryside and I go there on weekends and That's I do occasionally, I love that. Yeah. yeah, I do occasionally come back in for a client that I'm passionate about. In yeah. fact, I was in yesterday showing a client to my own listing, mm -hmm. um, you know, and they needed me. And the seller needed me, and I was required to be there, and I went happily. There was yeah. no begrudging of it whatsoever. A different scenario, maybe I'm not so excited about it, so that person needs to be you know, gently um, connected with somebody who would feel that passion for serving mm -hmm. them. And you've got people on and your team to do that. Yeah, I do. I've yeah. got three amazing agents and, and one incredible assistant. And then I have a virtual assistant who just killing it for me. And then I have my web development team and I have my copywriter. You know, there's quite a few people on the payroll to keep this show going. And I gratefully pay them mm -hmm. because I know that if, if it were, if I, if I were the, what is it, the cook, the bottle washer and 
I, there's another one in there, well. the baker. Yeah, no, I can't, yes. I can't do yeah, it all. Right. Exactly. And that's, I mean, yeah. Um, what, what are just in getting your philosophy and how you've established your success? What is your, do you, what I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to ask you one or both, what is your favorite speaker in our business or that motivates you and mm. inspires you? And then I want to know your favorite book. Oh, goodness. Uh, I knew you were going to ask recommended. that. I should have got my reading list out here. Uh, I have to say that probably my favorite speaker is Brian Buffini. If only that, I have been following him and his program and his systems for 17 years now. And not he personally, but people in his organization, including his two brothers, who I've become literally lifelong friends with, who I both consider mentors of mine. You know, through ultimately his mm-hmm. association with his organization, they have helped me reshape my so this life. Is his, he, I didn't know he had. He has two brothers. He has four brothers four. and a sister. Yeah. Let me okay. think. Oh, I'm trying to count right. I think his um, wife's family is even bigger. I think she's got like seventeen or something, if I remember right. <laughs> they have six. Or maybe kids, it's him. Maybe so. he's the one I'm thinking about. And then they have six kids. I think yeah. he's one of five or six. I should know. I've I've heard it so many times, but. He's quite inspirational, and, uh, you know, I need that. Mm-hmm. I need to feel good. I need to be inspired. And then I also need to be given tools. You know, like, mm-hmm. you can jack me up on motivation, but if I don't have anything I can go to do implement. with it, then it's not so useful. So, uh, you know, when I entered his coaching, I was literally pounding expireds, and I had, I think, a team of six or seven agents calling web leads nonstop, and... I mean, nobody wanted to do what any of us were doing. And ultimately, I would say that business model was doomed to failure. And, and I, I slowly, over time, realigned my business to working by referral. And, and now I see the real value in wow. that and the real value in, in creating relationships with people and truly being of service beyond the commission. Yes. I think we're all just phenomenal practitioners up until the moment we get paid. And then it's like, poof. Most yeah. of us are gone, but not yeah. me, not me. Like literally I'm making dinner reservations for somebody coming into town. They, they bought a property for their kids. Now they're coming into town to celebrate the birth of a baby and a birthday, you know, and she goes, she says That's to me, enough. I know you're not a concierge, but I would love your help because you really know DC. And I'm like, of course, love it. that's exactly yeah, what I'm here for. Exactly. Thank you for calling me. Yeah. I want people to call me for that kind of stuff. Yeah, I love it. All right, what's the book? Wow. Um, I'm so bad with titles because I read so many. Give us an author. Um, Maybe between the two uh, of us, we'll get the book. And a lot, what I've done now lately is I I listen to so many books because I'm constantly on the move. You know, we've got these kids, I'm walking dogs, I'm driving back and forth to the country. Uh, You know, there's, Mm -hmm. there's not much time where I have the joy and I really do love to read of just sitting down in a quiet corner with even 20 minutes, a half an hour to myself. It's somewhat non-existent. So I listen a lot. And one book that I just love, and, and I almost hate the guy's voice, but I've come to love it too. I think it's, um, I want to say Brian Tracy. Is it No Excuses? Yes. I have the book. Oh. I haven't read it yet. I actually uh, have the book on my shelf and I, No Excuses, No Excuses I mean, is that, waiting for me to read it. You really? Can't screw around after you listen to that oh, a few times. Oh, love it. That's and my I, next and I book. Yeah. And I think that guy on steroids is Darren Hardy, and I'm almost a little afraid to listen to him. Uh, so that's that's queued up in my next uh, audio book. It's going to be in mine, yeah. I know. And I listen to a lot of podcasts, believe it or not, and truth be told, I listen to your podcast a lot. Good. I was listening back to Jack Cotton. I think Seth O'Byrne is inspirational. Yes. I had found him before I'd even listened to your podcast. And, and I just love how people like you are kind of magnets for the oh, really good you. stuff. Yeah. And I can come to one place, your podcast, and I can hear from the greats. It's just inspiring. Well, so I listen you. to the Brian Buffini podcast. I listen to your podcast. I listen to Patrick Lilly's podcast, which is Real Estate Success Rocks. Um, I, I've listened to No Excuses a hundred times. I've listened to Focus by Daniel Goleman. Uh, the next Next one up for me is the 12 week year. Oh, interesting. Which, okay. Yeah. Who's that author? I should know because I've listened to the podcast so many times. I think I'm kind of the, 
the Google generation where my brain is kind of lazy because I know I can always find can the answer. Google. So I, where's the right. phone? Right. So I, I don't have it. to remember yeah. anything. It, you know, like if I didn't have my phone, I probably could call nobody. I literally oh, don't I, know a single yeah, phone number anymore. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of that right now. I'm really listening to a lot, both on That's books great. and podcasts and it just shows me a new way to be and think and do, and it inspires me to take what fits with me because I'm very clear about what I want and what's going to work for me and what can be authentically portrayed by me and, and bring that to my marketplace. And one last question, unless there's anything you want to add before. I don't know. Well, this I'll, is I'll, probably, I'll this is kind of the question. Um, what is the one thing you want our listeners to take away from this interview? Or if there's one thing, what would it be? I would say search your soul and be authentic to who you are. If you are truly authentic when you show up at work every day, the world will bring to you the right type of clients and will bless you with the life you want and really the life you want. I mean, what could be better than that? Was, that? That's beautiful. Isaac, I hope you wrote every word of that down because I'm quoting you on it. That was beautifully said. Awesome. Jeff, thank you. thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the interview. This has been great. Leave us You're with welcome. your website and your phone number before we close out. Sure. My mobile number is 301-442-8533. And my website is lifeatthetop.com. Oh, like the website address. Awesome. Check it out. Yeah. Well, and I have. I didn't remember. I think I looked. Maybe I Googled you or something. But awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. You're that welcome. Was great. Jerry, thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor. You're welcome. Talk to you soon.